I just want to start with making two uh, little points. One is that um, I've never done anything like this before, even live with, with students. I mean, I've normally just coached pieces and this is mainly going to be talking, just extracting as, we, as much as we can from the, from just looking at the score. So I, I want to imagine basically that we're sitting on a rock looking out the sea, just all looking at the score together. Um, but we will use instruments a bit just because we can probably demonstrate, well, I can certainly demonstrate better by playing than by singing, especially over Zoom. Um, and the other point I want to say is, we'll probably talk quite a lot about harmony, but I just wanted to say that I know almost nothing about harmony. I've had very little formal training. I've just picked up bits and pieces. And, um, and I hope that it, it becomes clear that a very little can go possibly quite a long way. And the important thing about all analysis and all talk about talking about school and talking about harmony and talking about everything else in analysis, form and structure, is the important thing to me is that it has to be felt that this is not academic and it's not, um, it's not enough to just know what chords are called and what chord relationships are called um, and what form structures are called. But it's much more important to feel the relationships so that um, it's possible to feel a relationship without knowing what it's called. And it's possible to know what it's called without feeling it. And um, I think what we want to try and do is make the connection between what we discover by looking at the score and, and what we feel about the piece. Um, and to me, that sort of integration between, between knowing and feeling is, is kind of the essence of, of what interpretation has got to be. Um, so, um, so I'd like to start just by maybe asking one of the quartets that are there. Actually, it's going to be a bit chaotic if I say it as vaguely as that. So can I ask the, somebody from the Emmeline, Emmeline Quartet um, just to characterise the general mood of the opening 20 bars or so of Opus 1592, just maybe comparing it to the opening bars of 1591, if you, if you know the first Wazanowski Quartet. So can you unmute yourself and maybe give me an idea just of the general character, the feeling you get from the first opening bars? Um, I, I will start. Um, so I find this one quite difficult to put my finger on. What I don't feel like there's very much like it because it's in 6-8, which is quite unusual, Yeah, I find. For a for a first movement, maybe I think the first Razumovsky is four four. I don't know it that well, but um, it's not. Oh, right. Uh, it's a simple time, but here we have a compound time with. Yeah. Um, and, and how does that make you feel, or how's that part of the character? It's very on edge. I'd say. Yes. That's yes. absolutely right. It's very restless and um, tense, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Let me, as you don't know Opus 59-1 very well, let me just say, I mean, basically, the opening 20 bars or so, 59-1, are very expansive, very genial. There's a mezzo forte marking, which is extremely rare in Beethoven. Beethoven's rarely mezzo anything. And, uh, but there is a mezzo forte mar marking. Um, the, the, the melody, it starts immediately with melody and it's continuous. And there's no harmony change whatsoever for, whatsoever for this um, first 20 bars. And when it arrives at its first forte, the only harmony change is that we hear, it's not really a harmony change, but we just hear the bass in the, in the bass, in the cello part. And that's, that gives you a big sense of arrival. And that, that sets us up to feel a huge expansiveness. The, the, the pace at which events happening are very, very slow. And um, now if you compare that with this opening, and we have 
a lot of rests. We have enormous dynamic contrast. We have a pianissimo after forticos. We have pianissimo. Um, we have changes of harmony every every other bar, and we have a completely unsettled sense. And so, I think when we're playing it, we need to emphasize that. We always need to to bring out a character. We need to really do the character in spades. So maybe tell me, what do you think about, there's a rest in bar two and a rest in bar five, is it? Uh, what's the character of the rest? Because rests can have their own character, can't they? Um, I guess suspense. Yes, and exactly. They're not restful yeah. rests. <laughs> They're full of uncertainty and suspense. Yeah. And they're yeah. rather abrupt, and the music just stops abruptly um, and then starts again. Um, and I think that's important in our body language, and it's just important of how we feel and the way we end the notes before the rest and start after the rest. It's very different going breathing and starting again and being held and then starting again. Um, so the rests have to be played as well as, well as the notes. Um, does anyone, <laughs> I don't want to get with so many people here, I don't want to sort of um, get lots of silences. I just wondered if someone would like to play bar on maybe on the violin, bar three and four. Amarin says, I know you're there with the violin. Would you, could you do that? <laughs> Maggie, be good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, yeah, thank you. Um, what do you think is the, is the, I would say there's one note which is really motivic in the whole piece on which is needs a certain amount of attention in what you've just played. Can you sort of think what that note might be? Uh, I, I would guess either the B natural or the D sharp, so. Well, I mean, of course, every note is important, but basically, the opening chords is, is E minor. It's just two declamatory chords in forte um, in E minor. And we have, uh, sorry, we have tonic dominant and the cello is, and the first violin is a rising fifth. So they're in contrary motion and that, that already sends, um, uh, Sort of, it almost asks the question, and so mm. the rest that follows is not is not mm. restful. And then we're in E minor. These are all. This is just an arpeggiated version of the opening fifth. Can you is it? Can you hear me? Okay, through that. Yeah. Um, so we have, and then it's decorated, and then it just goes back. Mm. So, so if we had. That would just be a dominant seventh, a B dominant seventh going back to returning to E. But the note which doesn't belong there is the C. Right, right. So, and, and I think to me at this point, it, is, it doesn't seem very important, but I think we'll see, we will see that this is absolutely key in the whole piece. It's one of the motifs of the whole piece, I would say. Um, so just play for me, missing out the C, the, the C for now. So just, can you just play that? Mm. The, 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 sorry, the zoom went funny, just try ah. it again. <laughs> Unfortunately, the zoom keeps stopping at the crucial moment on your B. So I'll, I'll, what you're doing, I think, is it? Yes. What I would say is because the C is there, 
there are various implications. The B can't be played in the same way because it's not, it's not just dying away to the A. I would say it's being pulled. There's a tension as it's being stretched up the semitone instead of just falling. So instead of, uh, it's, uh, and so I, instead of diminuendoing in the same way on the B, I would feel I'm a little bit, you know, something, maybe just the vibrato is inviting the C. Something like that. And I think the C has to be clear. And, and um, I don't know if you might want to do a tenuto on it, or probably not, that, 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 would, be, that would be fussy. But, but the bow has to come out, somehow make it, in, make it clear. So that we're hearing as a, as a sort of slightly lamenting, falling um, flat and six, falling onto the, onto the dominant and then back to the tonic. tonic. Um, and, and what would you, can you tell me anything about the implications for the intonation of the C? I don't know. Would you say it's a it's an ordinary semitone or a wide semitone or a narrow semitone? No idea. <laughs> what you're plucking is actually seems to me quite narrow, instinctive. And I would say that's correct. Right. I, I'd say it need, part of the expressiveness of this falling C is it can hardly be too flat because that actually makes right. the tension greater. If I play it in tempered way, that feels less expressive than yeah. I think, does it not? And, and I think we, we need to use intonation as part of the expressiveness. So that the C being there is, it affects the way we play the B and it also, the expressiveness comes into the pure intonation of it. For the cellists there, this is exactly the same um, as what's going on in the, in the Brahms E minor sonata. So, which actually goes on in every single movement of the Brahms E minor sonata. Um, and in the second movement, this is in, and in the fugue of the last movement, there's, there's a lot of C falling to B falling to, to, to E. So the, 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 the sort of, um, I suppose, having this feeling for the C, which I don't think I would guess just from the first few bars, but as as we go through the piece, it becomes more and more clear to me, affects both the intonation of the C and the way we join it to the B to, to extract the maximum sort of pathos from it. Um, okay, now what happens next? Maybe someone else would like to tell me from uh, one of the other quartets. Eliza, I can see you in my... Can you unmute yourself? Hi, sorry, hello. Hi. Um, yeah, so there are these pregnant pauses that we just talked about, these yeah. empty spaces full of anxiety and inertia. Um, yes. And then there's a sort of build up um, of that arpeggiated theme, I guess, if we can call it that. Yeah. Uh, which is uh, sort of sliced and first in the viola, then in the violin in bar nine. Yeah, just tell me about bar six, first of all. Bar six. Which is... Oh, yeah. So this F major um, version of what we've just heard again. Yes, and how um, does that make us feel? It's sort of like misplaced optimism, it seems. Yes, very and that, good. I think, I think that's quite unsettling as well. Yes, we hear the major... I mean, having been in E minor, very definitely, we're mm. immediately taken into... This is called a Neapolitan relationship. Right, yeah. Very important to know that, but, but you may as well. 
um, it's the semitone above. And it relates to the C as well, because the yeah. C now becomes the, the simple uh, dominant of, of F. So whereas it was painful on <laughs> here now it's yeah. now it's a very sort of relaxed thing. And uh, actually but that you... note as well, the, the D is um, equivalent, or the so C note equivalent, the D yes. is... Yes, and, and what's the difference? It. It's more of a kind of um, a podgitura effect rather and a hopeful thing rather than yes. Why is it less why is it less tense than the C is? So we have and now we have uh, sorry. It's part of yeah, it's part of the the F major. It's part of the F major. And 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 it's it's no longer a semitone, it's a tone, it's a whole tone. Yeah. So I would say I would want it to be quite a wide whole tone. So we emphasize the difference between the, the narrow and then so that it's, it's, it's very open and not tense at all. However, because we've heard the E minor, we know that there's something not very convincing about this F major. So what happens next? Well, it's what, what you said already, the, 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 opening, the opening arpeggios continue. But we've gone from E to F as a start, and now we go to F sharp, so we have the rising bass. Yeah. And the, the harmony is what now? In the viola? Um, it's diminished again. F exactly, it's F diminished F harmony, which is, which is tense. Which is, yeah. And then it's kind and of... And then tell me what the second violin does. It's got that C natural that we've had in bar in bar four. Exactly, it's got this lamenting. It's, it's got the relationship of the the flat and six falling onto the fifth. Yeah. So this so second violin needs to really feel that as a as an appoggiatura, and and um, not equal, and the the C definitely more than the B, and um, as narrow an interval as you dare. I mean, it's against it's against the F sharp on the first violin. I don't think it matters if the C sounds a little bit out of tune because then the B will put that right, mm. and it'll be part of the pain somehow that that stretching that interval. And then the cello has it, and then what happens? Maybe we should move to someone else. Um, so I don't want to miss out the people. Um, Juliet, that's another quartet, Carl Sag. Hello. Hi. So what happens now? Uh, um, so now it, it, after all of this stopping and starting, it's yeah. like a feeling like perhaps something's about to start moving. Yes. Um, but it's not quite in process yet. It's still ebbing and eaving um, in and out, which becomes very clear in bar 16 and 17, the way he takes this figure and develops it. But still, it, it's not quite finding its way out of the beginning motive. Yes, absolutely. So I completely agree with that. So in the bars you're talking about, bars 13 and 14, where we have... A... <laughs> Yeah. Um, what makes that feel as if we've maybe arrived or we, we've got started somehow? Hmm. Um, that feeling of going back into E, I, I'm... Yes. Um, It um the uh, how it develops in the next bar and how he 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 takes this ya da 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 and moves it even further ya da 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 da. Yes, yeah. He mm -hmm. ornaments. He, he ornaments, ornaments it the, further. The finger, yeah. yeah. I think the other thing is it's I think it's more or less the first time we have a proper uh, what we'd think of as a as a normal quartet texture. Ah, uh, yeah. 
the, yeah. the actually up, up to now we we've just had unisons and solos um not entirely but but certainly um we haven't had two bars of a texture in which there's a certain amount of counterpoint there are three voices and there's a there's a bass mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yes and, and the other thing is harmonically it's just we're just on the uh, it feels like this is the first bit of continuous melody and it's just swinging between tonic and dominant especially yeah. Yeah. but decorated yeah um, and in fact those two notes are the are the are the notes from the cello part and the very opening two notes. So we're just in piano um, uh, working around that. Uh, now tell me just what do you notice about the viola part? Do we have a violist? Hands up a violist. <laughs> ah, Abby, okay, Abby, so if you're playing this viola part, from in these bars we're talking about 13 and 14 what would you enjoy the most i i guess it's the counterplay between the viola and the violins the counterplay yeah so like yeah um yeah yes of yes of course you yes and what else but in your part in your own line itself What would you most like? What would you enjoy most? The, was... the augmented fourth between the, the F sharp and the C? Yes, exactly. First of all, we have this C again, which is falling. In. It's never far away. And then coming from the F sharp. As you say, it's this wonderful interval. Of, of a, uh, an augmented fourth or diminished fifth. Um, and, um, and so this emphasizes the C, it emphasizes the plaintiveness of the C. Okay, so uh, have you got your viola there? Yeah. Can you just play me the, the, those, those, uh, that bar, those two bars? <laughs> Okay, to me, if you want to really enjoy the, the interval, I would say it's almost obligatory to slide. I mean, to, to do a, a, deli a shift. So, you're doing... I don't know how well Zoom is, is catching the difference, but it's, it's, it's a vocal connection. Try that. Yeah, okay, thank you. That, I think that's great. And then you can control the amount of slide by, to me, that's a little bit too much. It can be more subtle than that. You can control it by using less bow at, during the, the time of the shift from one finger to another, you can almost stop the bow. Or if you want a bit more slide than that, then let the bow horizontally go a little bit further. But that's how you control it. But I think it's a shame not to have that. I mean, there are many times in which we need to avoid sliding unnecessarily. But there are other times when, when the music really needs that sort of vocal connection for a, for a, for a, um, a glissando of that, of that sort. So I, I would recommend that. And then just while you're there looking at the second violin part, just notice the second violin also has the falling, the fall from C to B, but in a different part of the bar. So... Uh, <laughs> So, so the vi second violin also needs to find the plaintiveness of that phrase. So I think everybody is playing uh, plaintively. And if you notice, cello and first violin, uh, the swell is marked to the middle. Well, it is for everybody, 
But I think then the C on the second violin then is in the next beat, and the C on the in the viola is in the next beat. So the sum um, of the stress of that um, interval, or the plaintiveness of the interval, or on every beat virtually. Um, okay, then as as Eliza said, the the those are two bars of seemingly normal quartet texture and melody. But, but it becomes restless again. We, we, we go away from quartet texture and into the running semi-quavers. Um, and then forte chords again, and then rest again, and then the repeat of the melody in different orchestration, different instrumentation, but more or less the same. And then running semi-quavers again. Uh, so it hasn't really gone very far, this melody, but, but there's still this feeling of, of, of a lot of restless, change and uncertainty um, and then we have a crescendo which takes us to the fortissimo in bar 26 which is um, a sort of transitional melody I think um, and in terms of playing I, well for, in terms of the composition I think this um, oh sorry I don't want to pass without not noticing one other thing about the, the main melody there, <laughs> is the rhythm, bum, ba 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 bum, is, is, is motivic as well. I think this is very important. Maybe it's fanciful, but possibly it relates to <laughs> dum, bum, bum, ba, and it's a reverse of that, dim, bum, bum, bum. Deem, bom, 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 ba, possibly, or maybe it's just coincidence. But anyway, that this rhythm, dum, ba, 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 is it becomes very important in the piece. Um, okay, I'm going to move on a little bit now. Um, so moving back to going to bar 26, we have three groups of two bars, do we not? Um, and the main voice is a really long five quaver note when, and a trill on the sixth quaver. Um, so maybe someone can tell me in terms of playing it, um, maybe one of the accompanying instruments, the, maybe a cellist in the quartet can tell me, is Joanna there? No, it doesn't sound like it. Um, I can't see because I've only got some of the some of the um, pictures on me. Um, uh, quartet cellist, <laughs> who wants to volunteer? Yes, I'm here. Oh, oh uh, yeah, of course, Finley. Hi. Nice to see you. Yeah. So, at bar twenty six, we have, <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then the third group. <laughs> Can you tell me how you would shape those six bars? Would you do them all the same? I mean, would there be the same relationship between bar one to bar two as there is from bar three to bar four, as there is from bar five to bar six? I could ask this of any of the instruments, but, but we're carrying the harmony. Uh, no, wouldn't, wouldn't do any of it the same at all. What would you do? Um, I think there's a, a certain release in bar 27 into the C minor. Yeah. Uh, in a way, bar 28 is then almost the most tense, but thir bar 30 is the biggest one, the most sort of... Yes, I completely agree with that. Why is, why is bar 30 the most, the most solid, you said? Uh, Meaning yeah, this, it wouldn't this, die yeah. away as much. Yeah. I completely agree. Why? Um, what well, it's again is this um, you get the, the kind of minor sixth in the bass and, and it's orchestrated much more widely than the other ones. Um, is it? It's lower. It, it's it's yeah, it's, yeah, that's true. It's certainly, yes, it's only the it's only the lowest. The the the, the first violin is a bit it, lower. It's, the, it's that you have before. this this minor sixth relationship again, the E flat, yes, in, in the same way as the C to the B. Exactly, it's the minor six again, uh, uh, falling onto a, we're, we're moving to a different key. 
and and the other thing I would say is it leads to D and basically we have D as a pedal going on for in terms of the quick movement of this piece it goes on for ages so it goes on for eight, eight bars I think it is until we get to the second group and what is D I mean why D why is he harping on the note D it's a long dominant to the the relative major exactly fantastic so so the second group is in the relative major of g major and d is the arrival of the the, the dominant of that and so it's an it's a big arrival point and that's why it's got, it's got to have a real feeling of finality that so it mustn't feel that it's random that there are three groups of two it must feel when you get to the third group that this is the one that's going to take us where we want to be um and, and that's why your instincts to keep sustain it almost crescendo through it despite this what sander i think is absolutely right um yeah good so then we have um then we have a lot of just play on the the dominant of, of the second group and and the cello uh the, um that um is a rising scale basically um which is prefiguring what the second group melody is but also it has this rhythm bum ba 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 bum ba 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 bum um so we're not allowed to forget that and the the violin answers uh, with the same rhythm um and then we get to bar 39 which is the second group which is in g major how does that feel I mean, it's it's a it's such a relief after yes. you've gone through in the last yeah thirty five bars. Absolutely, it, it's 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 warm and it's relaxed. I mean, principally, it's relaxed. Nothing happens. It just stays in G major, and it's got a very you know the rocking accompaniment in the middle voices um, are um, gentle. I think it's very important that they're they're played they're played very lightly and very gently, that they're not active. It's completely, there are a lot of notes, but they're completely inactive. Um, so very light and floaty. And, um, and first violin just needs to enjoy this release into, into a relaxed world. And how long does it last, the relaxation? Um, sorry, it's still, <laughs> still on me. I guess, yes. <laughs> You're just giving me all the right answers. <laughs> um, I mean, it's it's kind of interrupted by the da 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 di in in forty nine. Um, Is that the first cloud? Let me check. <laughs> um, I mean the C sharp in bar forty seven. Well, what about bar? When the second violin... Oh, sorry, the E flat in 42, I missed. Yeah, so the second violin takes over... But that, that's a cloudy moment, is it not? Um, yes. Because that's against... Um, that's diminished, is it not? Yeah, it's uh, not but it's only for it's one another, bar. It's another so minor sixth. Yeah, it's, uh, exactly. So it's for one bar. And then we have Dolce for quite a while which is hard to play because it's full of slightly awkward semiquavers, which all the instruments have, and that can often sound very sort of busy and awkward. In fact, whereas it's got to sound utterly fluid and relaxed and, um, and um, again, lots of notes, but absolutely the opposite of energy. It is completely calm. And then, yes, as you say, then it's, uh, then it leads, it, it, it transforms itself in bar 49 into tension again. And here we just have the naked rhythm. I mean, the main thing is dum, ba 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 bum, ba 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 bum, which has come in various guises, is, 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 is almost the main motive, except we also have diminished harmonies. And then um, two bars later, it relaxes where Beethoven marks his marks Dolce again, and we have a we have a nice falling melody on the viola, and but that's only for two bars, and then it changes again into tension in bar um, fifty three. Uh, another effort by the viola to relax us for two bars, 
Um, but that soon leads to this extraordinary passage of just syncopation. And I think maybe we, we can think of syncopation as um, dissonance, but it's dissonance on, on the rhythmic level. Um, so that whereas we have concords and discords in harmony, we have notes which are on the beats and on the main beats, uh, um, and we have notes which are strongly played on weak beats, which creates a, a, a rhythmic dissonance, which is, which is syncopation. And this is dissonance, rhythmic dissonance in spades, because it goes on for a long time. It's easy to lose the sense of the beat, but I think one should keep the sense of the beat so that one keeps the sense of the dissonance. Um, okay, now there's a fiddly little point, which is the strich mark, uh, by which I mean the little dagger, um, on two notes in bar, th in bar 59. We have to interpret what, what's going on and what do we mean by that. Maybe someone else wants to have a go. Cine. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, yes, hello. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I, I've always thought that the dagger is meant for the whole passage afterwards, that it's written for two, but, but it, it, it uh, yes. keeps going. And it's a... Uh, um, and it's a specific kind of articulation, uh, I guess. Um, this effect of of being syncopated the whole time, it's yeah. uh, it's sometimes actually difficult to for 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 it to not start sounding like 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 beats. Uh, this yeah. is a certain kind of a tension within the stroke itself. Also, yeah. I guess better when uses. Uh, also, in the second moment, um, yes. that there are passages where he marks marks a, a legato and at the end a, a dagger and a second dagger, and we, he sort we, of we will come to know, that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess he's yeah. So I guess he's sort of playing around with with the, um, he's. It seems like he's got a very specific idea on articulation, and it's sort of up for us to try and try and find 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 how to create attention. I guess. Absolutely. I, I don't know if it's meant for the whole passage or not. I think that's perfectly valid. I mean, he he absolutely characteristically and often does do that. I mean, writes a bar of um, of strichs and then and it carries on with the same notes and the same rhythm and they're they're definitely meant to continue. I mean, we know that from various orchestral scores and, and so on, where he writes them out um, for some parts and not others and so on. Um, Two, he usually does more than two, that's the only thing. Yeah. So that's arguable. If, if it, we also have to look, does he want those notes to be a little bit shorter than the ones that follow? Is he just throwing us off track? Because in the bar before we have, we have a crotchet and then we have, a, we have a, a note for three quavers and then a two quaver note. And then you could say two quaver note with a shortened end so that he's really throwing us I mean, possibly that's a, that's a way of looking at it. Yeah. Um, I've heard some quartets in recent times reiterate the second note. So they're going... Um, which we'll talk about in the second movement. Um, this seems to me unconvincing when I've heard it in, the, in this context. But I mean, it's another thing to think about. Um, so... I mean, these are markings. I don't have the answers to, to, I mean, nobody has all the answers to all these things, but we do have to think about what does he mean by, why has he written this and what does he mean by? We have to interpret it. We have to have a view on it and feel it and not just think, oh, a strich means such and such and therefore we just paint this on here because it, it means different things in all contexts. Sometimes it means, I mean, there are some places where it, I'm fairly certain it means to de-accent the note. Other times it means to accent the note. Other times it means to play it quite long. Other times to play it quite short. So context is all, and interpretation is all. These things are, are vague messages from the composer to us who have to try and understand it. So um, 
sorry, just I'm very interested because you mentioned the possibility of it only being uh, meant for the two uh, yeah. notes where it's written. How would you sort of interpret that? In for well, then I would think he wants those two notes to be shorter, more separated than the following notes. So I think the second note, the following note should be separated and there should be a, a you know, diminuendo on each note and, and something you can't really hear a join. But maybe with the dots on, with the, sorry, with the streaks on, a more noticeable gap. I mean, it's yeah. a possible, it's a possible feeling. Although I, I'm not very convinced by that myself. I actually like your idea that it's meant to continue. It just sets us off for the whole passage. No, it's interesting. I mean, yeah. I... Anyway, then it leads to a um, a sort of energetic bravura codetta, which is all in G major, just swinging between tonic and dominant, and repeat, and then we come back and reach the double bar. Um, so I'm not going to spend, I've probably spent ages already. Oh my goodness, I've spent masses of time on this. Um, okay, I think I ought to move on, although there's a lot more to say about this. Um, maybe I just want to pick out two things, possibly. Um, the section at 107, which is the C major <laughs> around there. Um, fortissimo. Um, th there's a handover, the viola plays in both teams, as it were, and there's a handover after two bars to the cello and viola, and then after another two bars, there's a handover back to the two violins, which the viola then joins, and then there's, after two bars, there's a handover, the cello and viola. What I want to know is, are those handovers the same? Should we be imitating each other or are they, are they different? I think, I think we need a, uh, it'd be good for a violist to tell us. Is there another violist in the house? Hi. Hello. Hi. Yes. Yeah, what think, do you um, think, Abby? Because they also lead to different places. So when it's with the violins, yeah. it kind of leads into the cello and the cello is like, that diminuendos, so the they're leading places. Are we? I mean, so um, so just say that again. It leads into the cello in what way? Sorry, I think my internet is really bad. I oh, know it's fine. I can hear you. I didn't. Okay. Know. <laughs> um, yeah. So when the first, the, when it first comes with the with the two violins. Yeah. Um, it just stays fortissimo and then it passes to the, the cello. Yeah. And when it's just the cello and viola, and then it diminuendos. So why does it then diminuendo? Um because then so it when, when the cello and the viola hang back to the two violins, what happens? Um well the harmony changes and yes. it feeds into A minor. Yes, and is A minor more, more tense or less tense than C major? <laughs> massively more tense. <laughs> massively more tense. So why are we diminuendoing it to A minor? Oh, um... Mm. I think we shouldn't be, should we? Sure. So, 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 so the difference is the violins hand over to the cello and viola and there's no change of key. So there's basically yeah. not much activity going on except a change of instrumentation. But when the cello and viola hand back to the two violins, the key gets more tense. So I think they should do a massive crescendo into A minor. And I think that trumps the fact that the line is going down. I mean, everyone's line is going down. So. Uh... So that it really leads to, takes us to A minor. And, it, and, it, and and we have the 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 fifth, the rising fifth of the, of the very opening bar, which is the other voice, which needs to be very strongly heard against the 
all these semiquavers from all the instruments. So there are two voices happening here, and one often doesn't really hear the, the rising fifth quite strongly enough. So it's important to differentiate, not to hand over in the same way. Um, again, a bit, a bit like the other the passage. And then after, the, after eight bars of this, or maybe you were, maybe you were looking at the next bit. You were, weren't you? Are yeah, sorry, I was, I was a bit confused. Right, you went into. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, we, we were just sorry. purposes there. So then, of course, Beethoven writes the minuendo. Um, and why does he write it? Why is he able to write a diminuendo there and not four bars earlier? The harmony has changed already in yes. the so two this bars. Time, there's no after. change in harmony. Yeah. Exactly. So we don't need to create a change of harmony by the way we approach it. And in fact, we get back to in pianissimo. <laughs> We get to get back to the main melody, but it's in the wrong key, isn't it? And then when it repeats, there's a, it's in a poco retard um, on the cello. And maybe this is because we're, we're in a subdominant key, which is usually has less tension in it. Uh, and, and maybe that's why the music actually, it's the first time it rips in any way. So there's, there's a slight relaxation in tension because we're in a subdominant. And so the diminuendo going into the A minor in bar 114 is, is partly setting that up. So we have the, the A minor as a, as a very plaintive, you know, it's a plaintive key, but it has less energy perhaps than the E minor. Um, Okay, and the only other thing before we leave this movement, because it's high time, um, uh, but this is very important in the coda, if we can now skip to bar 228. I hope you've got bar numbers. If you haven't got bar numbers, it's, it's about 15, 20 bars after the second double bar. And it's where the syncopations begin again. So the syncopations um, begin again, and then it crescendos to a huge fortissimo. Are you with me? And um, and then he just hammers out these fortissimo chords in bar two, three, five, six, two, three, seven, two, three, eight. And basically, what we have, we just have plain naked on when there no melody. We just have B in the cello. <laughs> seeing the violin again and again he's just hammering it out so that's the you know the harmonic crisis which has been permeating the whole piece sometimes plaintively sometimes with this time is with anguish or maybe anger um, and then the first one in goes again wizard goes falling from its hopefully low c onto the b and then takes us back to E. And then even the very last gasp, um, three bars from the end, where we have, uh, and the second violin in a syncopation position is again, sort of sobbing on the scene. And the and cello and the violin have E. So this CBE, this is not an accident. I mean, it's all over the piece. And it's, um, and so it ends quietly and, and in this lamenting way, but it's a very dynamic uh, and, and uh, excited and incredibly creative movement. I mean, it's, it's as, as we said right at the beginning, there's really nothing like it, nothing to compare it to. So quickly moving on to the slow movement. Um, can someone um, just describe the character of the slow movement uh, to me? Someone who hasn't had a chance yet. Uh, and I'll say, I can't see everybody who's here. So someone volunteer.
I mean, I think it's easy to feel. So it's just a matter of finding the words to describe the character of it. Um, Charlotte, I can see. Do you want to try? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, I think um, the beginning is very a very sweet character. Um, for sure, but later it gets much more, um, um, yeah, dramatic. Um, but I think throughout the whole piece, there's a lot of sentiment in the in the sound and the character. Yes. Um, I mean, in contrast to the first movement is incredibly long, continuous, uninterrupted melodic line, isn't it? Um, uh, would you say it's sweet or would you say it's... I'm not sure about sweet. For instance, he marks Espressivo, which is usually in, in, in bar 17 for the second violin. Usually that implies it's a little bit more intensity there than if he hasn't marked it. Do you know his description of this? Because Beethoven, dis well, according to Czerny, who's not always reliable, but no reason to doubt this, he describes it, I wrote it down somewhere. Um, Beethoven speaks of being inspired by contemplating the starry sky and thinking of the music of the spheres, which is a rather wonderful um, description, I think. Um, so for me, there's a feeling of reverence about it. Maybe, maybe more than sweet. I mean, I know what you mean. And of course the E major immediately is, 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 inc is a wonderful feel when you hear it, having heard so much E minor. Um, uh, but there's something maybe reverent and mystical about it, which basically, I mean, Beethoven's description um, suggests to me. Maybe also notice that how the melody is built, that this falling semitone of the very first bar of the first movement says, <laughs> Um, is now the it's the falling second of the but 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 sounding so beautiful in in the E major harmonization, so there's been a complete transformation of the angst into something that was utterly consoling, um, and then the whole of the rest of the movement really is made of of the melody is falling seconds until the end. So we have, uh, and then, they're all falling seconds uh, until, so fundamentally that's the, that's the bare bones of it. Um, so when it, when it actually rises and for the first time, in the sixth and seventh bar. I mean, that's where he writes crescendo and then forte. So I think, the, the, so he's introducing, I mean, that's maybe why they're there, the, that it gives, um, it, it gives some energy to the melody. Um, the other thing is, of course, there's the dotted note, which gives it a sort of rhythmic, just enough rhythmic personality. So rather than what I played, <laughs> And, uh, which transforms the melody into it gives it a real personality um, but it also provides one of the motives for the rest of the piece because there are a lot of dotted notes and um, as Sini alluded to that he has many different ways of notating these dotted notes and we as interpreters have to think what this means so we have bar eight or nine, where we have this very complicated notation. Quaver tied to a semi-quaver with a strich on it, and then another semi-quaver with a strich on it. And then bar 16, we have quaver with a strich on it, semi-quaver rest, semi-quaver with a strich on it. Um, and that's that one. And then a few bars later, bar 23, we have dotted quaver followed by a semi-quaver. So that's three different ways of notating within a short space 
and then it's not it's not the same rhythm but uh in the in the second group at bar 30 in the b major ba bum ba bum we have the double dotting but it's still a a, a sort of first cousin of of the dum ba bum ba bum so um I'm not. I don't know necessarily what the answers are, but we have to think. Every, every every player has to think. What does this mean? I think the one at sixteen is quite interest. It's quite easy, isn't it? I mean, how would you describe that, Charlotte, as a articulation? Um, sorry, my my internet is very. I, I couldn't quite hear what you were saying. Oh, sorry. I mean, I was wondering how you would describe sorry. the articulation at bar 16. Um, this is the first time in the piece that there is like, in this movement, uh, that there's like a stable, clear uh, pace. Yeah. Um, because before everything is very, uh, melodic and everyone can take uh, as much freedom as they want and here the first violin um, very much sets this pace. Yeah, it's a bit like clockwork isn't it? Bum, 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 bum. I'm very precise I think because I mean it's very precise to write a semiquaver rest and then a, and then a semiquaver with a strich on it so it's almost like pizzicato mm. Now that's, I think, very different from the most normal marking is the marking in bar 23 um, or 25. <laughs> um, so that's, uh, that's probably the, 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 the least complicated marking. And I think conventionally, one would expect to be a certain amount of dying away on each dotted quaver um, and not completely, maybe not completely joined. So the big question is what does, what does the notation at bar nine mean for the first violin? Um, do you want to uh, maybe have a go with that, Juliet. Um, so when you were talking uh, previously about whether this means that it should be separated or not, yeah. I personally didn't think it should be re-articulated within the slur, just for taste-wise, just because I think this theme um that emerges out of it is it isn't supposed to add extra onto what already exists which is the beginning theme and it's more supposed to float above it and create a perhaps more intimate texture mm. to the very um chorale like beginning that we have already yes. been exposed to so i i don't know i interpret it I interpret that articulation as a, a breathlessness rather than uh, something to add a particular added rhythmic structure to it, as you say, which is what happens in bar 16, I think. And yes. personally, I don't think what happens in bar nine. Yeah, the, the, there's, a, there's a bit of a there's quite a background to this conversation and there, there, there are, I have to say, musicians who I most admire completely don't agree with me. I mean, they, they, oh, no. three or four people that I most admire think there should be some sort of re-articulation. Um, um, but I can't, just can't feel that, so I, I, I wouldn't do it. Um, I, agree, <laughs> I agree with you. I think one has to consider this with a whole lot of other places. For instance, the Gross to Fugue, which I don't know if you've played, but the crotchet at the beginning of the melody, um, let's go, is notated not as a crotchet, but as a quaver tied to a quaver. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, 
So I'm beginning to hear people articulate that, which I feel is not right. Um, but uh, but 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 it's interesting what he might mean by that. And then um, there's uh, there are two bars in the same movement of the harp quartet where he has again he has um, quaver tied to quaver instead of crotchet. And he has a strick, and sometimes he has a strick at the end, and then the strick stops. Um, and various other places where he ties notes to other um, other ties. In in um, Beethoven Piano Sonata 101, there's an interesting example of that. Um, one of the later Beethoven sonatas um, for the cellist Opus 69 A Major. It's it's uh, that. The piano is marked on the tied note. The fingering is two different fingers on the tied note. So instead of the piano goes something like five, three. And then the cello comes in with no marking at all, apart from a completely normal tied note across the syncopation. So there's a big issue of what does he mean for the piano? And also should the cello be doing it? Mm. So I think my feeling is, and I'll just offer this for what it's worth, but I'm not at all, I'm not at all sure I'm right. But I think Beethoven is becoming very interested in the convention which he grew up with, which is what was that long note should die away and be slightly short, unless they're slurred to the next note. Mm -hmm. And that all these ways of trying to edge towards a notation where the notes don't die away so much, or they, or they don't stop, or there isn't a gap before the next note. Uh, sometimes he wants a gap, but he doesn't want them to die away. And sometimes he wants them to die away, but maybe not have a gap and all sorts of combinations. So I think he's interested in the sustaining or otherwise of notes. It's particularly difficult on the keyboard. So pianists can have to really work on giving the illusion of singing through notes sometimes. Um, we can actually do it on our sustaining instruments and singers can do it. So it's a question of where to do it and how much to do it. And uh, for me, it, it's all about that. So in the Grosser Fugue, I just feel he wants the sound to be a block of sound from beginning to end. He doesn't want it to diminuendo. Um, it ends in a rest anyway, so there's no question of it joining the following, uh, the following note. But he does want it to be full length so that you feel the second quaver as a quaver and it's full length. And I would say here, um, uh, so I'm trying to think where the cello has it. Um, sorry. Um, I think it doesn't want, but something much more singing. I would practice it by playing it legato and then adding some speaking, some sort of parlando for the quicker notes. So it both sings and it speaks in the way that Cassandre is wonderful at playing in his, in his playing, there are wonderful examples of that. So so that there's some singing through the longer note and then some articulation on the two, on, on the, the, and I suppose the first strick is because he does not want it to be completely joined. He wants it to be a long note, but he doesn't want it to be completely joined to the following note. Um, so, and I like to feel the second quaver, but not quite to play it. But anyway, that's that's my view. Um, but it's, and I'm not saying it's right, but I think we all have to have a view of what this notation means. Um, Okay, now moving swiftly on. Um, there are more examples of the flattened six, just in passing, for instance, in, uh, in bar 24 and 25, there's a... And I mean, these things are highlighted by being such wide intervals as well. So, so the G is a flattened six to to B, which we're about to arrive in. Um, and then we have the, 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 the B major melody at bar 27, where we have 
the double dotted notes, which again have a slightly March like feeling. <laughs> and then it varies much singing after that. So I think there, there's a case for overdotting, and maybe that suggests that we shouldn't overdot the previous versions of dotted notes, because here he writes it out, the, the double dotting. Um, there's another form of dotted note where the viola repeats in bar 33. Uh, and here, because it's the viola is playing the same note on a um, on a on a dominant um, for bars and bars. I would say this is a slightly more rhythmic. It's slightly more towards the clockwork, although it's not notated like that. Um, compared to exactly the same notion in bar twenty four, which seems to me more more lyrical and singing. But all these opinions I'm just giving you are just because the, the context of the music suggests that to me. And I'm really wanting to point out that markings are not, as, as Garfield, uh, our violist often used to like say, that markings are not like a, a set of paints in a paint box. And, you know, this is a sortsando and this is a slur and this is a dot. And we, we just pick them up and put them onto our playing when we see the composer mark them. And they mean many, many different things in many, many different contexts. So we must never do anything we don't completely believe in with total conviction, uh, just because it's a marking and the composer says sports under. So we've got to, if we think we've got to play a sports under in a certain way, then it'll be mechanical or unnatural. And it should never be that. It's always got to be felt and unnatural. Um, and these, these markings, you know, he's trying within the very limited repertoire of, of symbols that there are in music, he's trying to give very subtle messages of how to play. And mostly those messages just come from us to what our feeling about the music is. Um, okay, I think I better skip a lot. Um, so can we skip to bar 74? Now, for those of you, I don't know if there are those of you without bar numbers, but it's where the first violin has... Uh, and the second violin is... Uh, the second violin has that. And then there's a big, big, big wind down when the cello now has... the recapitulation. So um, just to point out, which you know, you know what I'm going to say in bar 74, where the violin has and the cello has that, there we have the clash between B and C again. So it's, I mean, it's not resolved in the first movement and it goes on in this movement in, in a particularly um, sad and painful way in piano and the it, it carries on and the cello has and again so the second violin has again the, the low c which leads to this time a forte b and then we get to the recap so we've not we've not lost sight of that and, and and immediately should make us think of that clash which happens in the first movement. Um, okay. Um, what else can we look at? Yeah, some of this used to puzzle me a lot. Maybe does would someone like to tell me what the character is in bar 138? So this is almost at the end of the movement. It's in the coda where he suddenly has a crescendo to fortissimo and lots of sorts, Andy. Um, anybody who hasn't yet had to go want to suggest something? Again, I can only see people who've spoken, I think. Uh, 
on my not very big screen. Um, okay, maybe Abby, what would you say? What's the character of this Fortissimo? Um, it's kind of like a huge moment of like existential crisis <laughs> or right. um, understanding or something. Yes. Okay. I mean, I, I thought, I sort of thought that for a long time because the harmonies are quite tense, but how does it, how does it work in a piece which is basically so heavenly and calm and consoling? How does it work to have these, what is it, eight bars, seven or eight bars of, of existential crisis suddenly in the middle of all that? And then it goes back to very quickly to a completely calm codetta, which is just very calm, it ends very calmly. I mean, emotionally, how does that work? That we just have eight bars of calamity in the middle of <laughs> such a very long and peaceful movement. I mean, what emotional story is being told there? I I guess like finding meaning. I guess the whole movement has been searching and this is the moment where he sees something in the stars. <laughs> or he <laughs> right, figures it out. <laughs> well, but do, is your feeling that for most of the movement that it's that it's searching and and root unrooted? I mean, the same, the main melody at the beginning. Mm. Or the second melody on the second violin. I wouldn't say the melodies are, are unrooted or, I'm not sure. No, I don't think I would. I mean, for me, when I hear the piece and we've had this incredibly restless first movement, which end, ends in a very restless E minor, which has even got this falling C to B at the very last bars. It's, it's um, and then you hear the slow continuous melody in E major, beautifully harmonized in this wonderful chorale. Um, and most of what follows, I find it sort of completely peaceful and consoling. Yeah. And, and, and only the, the, the memory of the B clashing with the E, which I just pointed out, which is only a passing moment to me is the only memory of the first movement. Otherwise, we're in a different world. That's how I feel it anyway now. But I mean, you might find a way of playing the second movement, which is less settled than I'm suggesting, in which case then your interpretation of the fortissimo, you know, could work. But I find if one hears it as a very settled thing, and then we suddenly have seven bars of great anguish, it doesn't quite work for me. So what I've come to feel is that, is that these bars in Fortissimo and with all the sports sandy, one shouldn't play the sports sandy harsh, harshly, but it was basically Beethoven saying, glory be to God. I mean, that is actually a, 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 next, a very positive exclamation of uh, affirmation of he's been lying there uh, inspired by the stars and the greatness of the heavens. And he's, um, the sort Sandy are celebratory rather than harsh. And I think, I mean, that's my, that's my present take on it. I'll no doubt feel differently in five years time. But, um, but it's just to a reminder that Fortissimo and Swart Sandy is repeated, don't necessarily have to be harsh and challenging and anguished. They can be anything. I mean, they've got to be there. We can't ignore them. But they can be celebrations as much as they can be. Um, and, and so I wouldn't be digging in the string. I would do sort of big sort of fast bows on them and, 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 and uh, strong vibrato on them and warm vibrato on them. And, uh, and, and yes, there's some release. There's a huge release on the first million scale going down. But it's a, it's a coming down from that from that mood. So it's a sort of exaltation or an exaltation. 
both. <laughs> I think Beethoven's feeling exalted and he exalts in it and that's his way of doing it. Anyway, that's my feeling, but it, that makes sense in the context of the whole movement. So I suppose I'm also making the point that, that when we choose a character in the movement, it's got to make sense, the movement has to tell us, the music's telling us a story and the story has to fit, it has to make sense. I mean, you wouldn't sort of put three passages of Dostoevsky in the middle of a, a P.G. Woodhouse story, because it just <laughs> wouldn't make sense to anybody. And, um, and it, so I, th I think, you know, one doesn't put, of course, there, there is music where we suddenly have a flashback to previous movements and previous characters, but we're hearing that as a memory or we're hearing that as reality and what we've been listen to, listening to is in some way slightly false, or false solace or something like that. There has to be a story behind it. Um, anyway, so I want to not really say this is the answer, but raise the question for everybody. Um, okay, I'm going to move on because I don't want to miss out all the movements. So um, now we had, in my quartet, we had, we had quite a lot of disagreement about the character of the next movement. So perhaps somebody tell me what the character is <laughs> and then I can relay it to my colleagues. Um, uh, Amarins, what do you think? Um, I think it's very unsettled and afraid the third movement right very worried yeah yeah do you feel there's anything i mean that's that's what some of my colleagues feel and that's i mean i'm always shocked by i completely can accept beethoven's metronome marks for the other three movements in this piece but his mark seems incredibly fast to me for this movement yeah and uh, but what you're saying you know, make sense of that tempo marking. We did try it. We we tried it for a long time, and I think yeah. um, in the end, when we left bars as a longer structure, it made more sense in the tempo, and then yeah. everything fit in place. But I had to work like clockwork. Yes. Um, almost feeling like you played too early. <laughs> yes. No. Absolutely. Well, the rhythm, dum, ba, bum, bum, ba, bum, but has to be absolutely as if one person is mm -hmm. playing it, which is hard. And, and all the all the fitting, yeah. And I think also, you know, except for the cello, the fact that nothing is really on the downbeat gives it this very kind of unsettled. Yes. Feeling. Yeah. I, I'm I I'm absolutely sure you 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 you're right in part. I mean, I I think it certainly has that very restless element. Do do, do you feel? Am I the only one who feels it also has a slightly melancholy and wistful? feeling to it absolutely also yeah as well mm -hmm. so so that's the and that suggests something a little bit slower to me somehow i mean I, i'm playing it particularly you know i wouldn't play to that i think that's slow but mm -hmm. i'm just the notes seem to be the falling notes and the harmonies feel that they have that wistfulness a little bit yeah, definitely. So compared to the trio, the middle section, um, which has none of that at all, yeah. uh, nor does it have the, have the restlessness. I mean, that's that's um, and the the uncertainty. So yeah, I think that's fine. It has, it has both those both those elements. Does anyone want to add anything to that or disagree with that? Feel very free to disagree. I think it has a certain bounce to it. Yeah. The cello kind of bouncing on the first beat and everything's. Yeah, um, I think that's right. I mean, just the rhythm, yum, ba bum, yum, ba bum, ba. But it has a certain energy, which we've which has been totally lacking in the second movement. But it's a regular energy, unlike the energy of the first movement. So it is is a dance. I mean, it has elements of a dance. So it's a restless, um, uncertain, melancholy, wistful dance <laughs> and many other things. Um, okay. Um, one thing, by the way, we haven't talked about yet. 
um, is repeat. Um, what's special about this piece in terms of repeats? Uh, anybody, Eliza? Sorry. About the whole piece or just, or there's this movement? The, the whole piece. Um, let me just quickly remind myself of how the rest of the movements go. Um, there are no other repeats apart from in this movement? No, it's in fact the That's opposite. The, in, in the first, I think Beethoven is thinking about repeats because in the first Razumovsky, I think this is the first time in, in uh, classical writing where there's no exposition repeat. And he pretends there's a repeat, and then suddenly it goes off in a different direct. The music goes off in a different direction, and that certainly hasn't happened in any quartet before. And I don't think it's happened in general in Haydn, but it's not Beethoven. Um, and then there are no repeats at all in the second movement in the scherzo. We're talking about the first Rosmoski or the third, and the first repeat, which is a conventional exposition repeat, is actually in the last movement in Rosmoski one. Now in this piece, we have two repeats in the first movement. We have a develop, we have a, at the end of the development before the coda, we have a repeat, which makes the movement absolutely enormous. And you rarely, rarely hear, hear it played. Um, there's a first time and a second time bar um, written at that point. So the first time bar, if you're going back to the development, um, and he's again, he's clearly doing this deliberately. And I raise it to this point because in this in this Allegretto third movement, we have a repeat scheme which, instead of being A B A, is A B A B A. We have the trio twice and the main section three times, which is also a new departure, uh, pretty new. Um, it's certainly new in, in Beethoven's quartets, I think. Actually, I'd better check that. Um, uh, so he's thinking about repeats. I mean, he's subverting every convention that there is, and this includes repeats. So I think, again, as interpreters, we need to think of what are repeats for? And why is there none in the first Razumovsky? And why are there two in the first movement in the second Razumovsky? And are we going to do it? And if we're not going to do it, why are we, not, why are we making a cut of about seven minutes in Beethoven's music? And if we do do it, how are we going to play it? So, um, what makes it, you know, what makes it interesting? What makes it there? Why is it there? Um, so I haven't got to the point where I can understand it. <laughs> so, um, I, I, um, I have done it, but I haven't done it very much because I need to feel it. I need to feel why it's there. And I, I think it's my problem that I don't feel it. I, I'm, absolutely trust Beethoven 100%, so I'm not, I'm, I'm sure there's a good reason for it. But because I haven't felt yet, I'm not, I haven't, I haven't yet played, I haven't played it very much. But, but at the very, very least, do try it, do try it in performance. And don't just miss it out because everyone else misses it out. And come to a view about it and try and see why there's a, why Beethoven wrote it, because he will have good reasons. There is some writing about second repeats in uh, that Hans Keller's written, and I can't remember the exact reference, but mainly in relation to Haydn quartets. I think it's in his book about Haydn quartets. And he, he was absolutely convinced that every marked repeat should be done in every circumstance, which I can't say I agree with. But he makes a case for why Haydn wrote, writes second repeats in certain movements and not in others. Because Haydn does quite a lot, but not usually, I mean, less than, less than half the time. So um, that's, has anyone here got a view on the second half recap, repeat? I guess I'll yeah. just, ooh, sorry. Sorry, Emeryn, go. I was just thinking, you know, the first and the third movements seem like the most kind of tense, unsettled movements, right? Yeah. I wonder if it, 
you know, could have something to do with the structure of the whole piece that he was thinking he wanted this, you know, really unsettled feeling and he wanted to, you know, prolong that because, you know, the third movement also goes around and round and round again. Yeah. Um, the, that unsettledness with like the, the other two opposing movements because actually the last movement is very short and yeah. very jubilant in comparison that it was that kind of balance that he really wanted the piece to feel darker, but he did have some jubilant movements. But I mean, honestly, that's just something I just thought of. Um, I think that's I think that's excellent. I, th I think I think you're right. I think that could be the key to it. That there's a continuous pendulum between between tension and and relaxation, which is very extreme in this piece. And when you get to the end of the first movement, you know, it's, it's not nothing is not resolved but it's sort of quiet and then he kind of forces you back into all the turmoil of the development again just when you think you're safe and um and in the third movement yes you're you're going between you know the the the, the calm and the jolliness of the of the middle section back into the restless melancholy of the of the main section so that you never feel that you're sort of settled there i think that yeah i think that, that that's very plausible way of looking at it. What were you going to say, Cindy? Oh, I mean, I think that's, you know, great. And I, I think this, um, there is something about both the first and third movements is that as much as it's trying to go somewhere, it sort of never really reaches where it's trying to so anxiously go. Um, I, yeah. I've, I've actually performed a couple of times sort of with the with all the repeats and there's also something about sort of the proportions to the enormously uh you know universal feeling second movement uh in that when you know simply when when the first movement is is bigger in the proportion of the whole piece uh so, somehow there's something about that that works um because yeah. also i think the point has been made that it's relatively unusual. I mean, Beethoven writes a lot of pieces that start start in a tragic mode, but it's relatively unusual for them to also end in that, uh, like this one does, like the coda yeah. ends in disaster. And and somehow the sort of, I don't really know, but there's something about the dram dramaturgy that changes when <laughs> when there is just more of the first moment. But yeah. that was a random thought. Yeah, no, I'm sure that's also point. Just the the proportions, the balance of proportions between a moon, which is partly to do with length. Yeah, yeah. I think also for for us today, I mean, for audiences today and players today, our you know attention span is less <laughs> than than Beethoven's would have been or Beethoven's audiences would have been. We get impatient with repeats, and um, and I think that's partly because we don't feel these tensions enough. And we, we don't feel the you know being drawn back into the turbulence and we think oh we know this but uh, and it's up to us as players to try and you know really make it work really make people feel this is absolutely necessary it's all, it has to happen um i sometimes hear a sort of sigh when i hear repeats being done the sigh in the audience but that's always when the performance is not very good if the, if the performance is great then nobody minds at all <laughs> so um okay so uh um just going back to the third movement now so in bar i just want to look at bars 17 to 20 1 2 3 4 and 5 about 17 to 25 uh Tell me what's going on there, somebody. Um, uh, I don't know all the names. The names have changed. Um, Abby, you tell me, or one of your colleagues. You're muted. Abby, you're muted. Yeah, I think Rob, Rob is going to say something. OK, Rob. Where is where is Robert? Hi, I'm here. Oh, you're there, right? Okay. Um, so in bar seventeen, we are in F major. 
Yeah. Which compared to E minor, the key of this quartet is quite unusual. Well, we've had it. It's the Neapolitan relationship which yes. we talked about yes, from the exactly. second phrase. So, uh, and then, yeah. so we're back. We're back there. Yeah. But what's the mood? And what's the mood of it? Um, quite bouncy. I think. Yeah, the, it's transformed the from the is, first movement. The bass line is quite fun. Yes. Uh, and he's written those daggers on bum bum. Is that the same in your edition? Yes. Yeah. That just means not to join them and, and that they're, it's a yeah. rhythmic thing. Bum, 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 bum. Yeah. And there's yeah. a dominant pedal in the viola uh, with open C. Yes. Which is, which is amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and then. then yeah, what happens go, when, as happen it goes in into bar 20, 1, 2, 3, bar 4, fortissimo for everyone, yes. long note. B, um, but we have the uh, C at the top of the chord. Yeah. Is that right? And we have the B at the bottom. Yes. So it's the old C, B clash. Yes. Which is, which is we've been talking about all the time from the first movement onwards and happened in the second movement and that's here. I mean, it's, again, it's not just a passing thing. He's emphasizing it goes and goes and it, it crashes into this harmonic crisis of C and B, which is then um, diffused by the... And again, the, the first violin falls from the C to the B. I have a question. E I have a question about um, yeah this bowing here. So in 24, 23, 22, where viola and cello have ba -ba -dum -dum -dum. yeah, and then if you did up down up down yeah, then you would end on on an up in the fortissimo. Yes, which you don't want. So I would just. Uh, so, so you've got two choices. You either do two downs, but I think it's better to do just down up, down. So that your gap is not, if there's going to be a gap, it's not determined by anything technical. Yeah. So. I see, yes. Um, yeah, no, you have to be on a down, but I would say there are very few things that I would insist on in terms of bearing which way around it has to be, but. <laughs> I think it'd be very bizarre for you to be on an up on that note. A big fortissimo and then all the tension and then the diffusing of the tension there. <laughs> it's very important, the diffusing of the tension. So that so that when we hear the C on the violin, that's probably the most melancholy part of the of the, the falling C to the B of the movement. And then he repeats it just in case we didn't get the point. Uh, we get we get yanked back into F major again, and then and then the same crash, harmonic crash, and then a coda. And then we have the maggiore, the middle section, which is in contrast, very contrapuntal texture. Um, after the basically we've had melody and accompaniment in the in the main section. Now we have a lot of counterpoint. It, it shows that counterpoint isn't in some way serious or more or more difficult and more complicated because actually this this section is is a is much more fun and playful and dancing than anything we've had in the piece um and it's done through uh, partly through counterpoint um so um do you know the history of this do you know why why this melody is here Beethoven writes tame russe You probably do, but someone tell me. Finley. Hello. Hello. Yes. Um, so Beethoven put in um, the first two Razumovsky quartets direct quotes from uh, Russian songs, Russian folk songs, as a homage to Count Razumovsky, who the quartets were dedicated to. Yes. 
that's that's correct on this particular melody it's... which Rosimovsky would have recognized why would it be, why would it have made him laugh well, it, it was it was originally a, a hymn to God, I think. Well, it was a, a folk tune, but but it was it was taken on took on religious connotations at some point. But Beethoven treats it so kind of flippantly and non seriously, and and it used to be very slow. I think it was original. Yeah, Algio. spot on, spot on. It was it was a it was an it was a hymn. It was a hymn. It was slow. It was processional. It was it was used in Orthodox church settings and Beethoven who probably felt he had to put in something Russian but probably slightly resented having to do anything in his music which was from an external pressure very mischievously um, turns it into into this playful brisk dance dancing style uh, melody which will have brought a smile to everyone who knew it uh, and it works beautifully that way. You can hear it more in its original form in Mussorgsky, in uh, Good and Good Enough, um, and other, and actually other in Arensky Quartet, if you know that, um, which is done with peeling bells all around it in the Arensky. So, um, um, yes, one thing about the phrasing. Um, this uh, would you play would you play those the same or not and if not why not um i wouldn't play them the same at, at this point maybe when when it comes back later yes um do you want to play me the melody as it's a viola melody at the beginning do you have your viola there I, I I play the cello. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I'm getting confused. <laughs> you do. No, Miguel. <laughs> sorry, Finley. No, 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 no problem. problem. <laughs> Miguel. 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 Okay, great, that's really good. And what you did, which I really liked, was the, the first slur sort of knew that it was, it just had to give an impulse for one bar. Whereas the next slur knew that it had to give an impulse for two bars. And I really felt that it wasn't, which gets very tedious because we hear it again and again. So I would say the, the trick is that the second slur needs to sing through the slur more. So and then so the B is more sung, as, even though it's the second note of the slur, than the F sharp in the first slur. And then one other thing which didn't quite work, I thought, um, where you came away from this and then did a sports sando, but Beethoven writes crescendo. And it's very, in a way, it's very natural to do what you did, but I think it, it works better to follow Beethoven's marking. So there's only one arrival point and not two arrival points. Um, good. So, um, uh, yeah, no, not much. And then there's another kind of, it's a very good nature, this movement. It has slightly different contrapuntal um, counter subjects. Um, and then when we get to, towards the end, again, we have another sort of rude crash into fortis fortissimo. Um, and is this rude crush like the other crashes we've come on it crashes we've had in the like the first section of this movement and we had in the slow movement and we had in the um, first movement or is it what, what is it do you see what I mean with the 40 yeah is, it, is this a one 105 yeah exactly and um, I mean I, I always feel like uh, Beethoven is sort of taking the joke to the the extreme here by writing in this kind of almost quite bad counterpoint here <laughs> it's it, it's yeah. 
simplistic mean, and yeah. like bashing over the head with the theme, which we've already heard four or five times. Yes, I, I agree. I mean, there's but, a simplicity about it. I mean, maybe but, but I, I, I wouldn't play it with the, the any kind of aggression or anything. It's it's the it, it's still playful and fun as well. Exactly, it's playful. It's nothing to do with the C B clash. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a bit of a its own car crash, but it's nothing to do with the C B clash. There's no C and there's no B. And it's just the cannon gets closer and closer. I think maybe it's something to do with the ringing of bells. Mm. So you could see it as celebratory ringing of bells rather than a, um, rather than a, a, a kind of something that's satirical. Because mm -hmm. I'm not sure satire quite fits here, but maybe I may, you might be right. You might be right. I mean, it's certainly, and then it's followed by an incredibly sophisticated, chromatic, beautifully harmonized. I mean, couldn't be more opposite. Having had this absolutely simple tonic dominant canon, we have this absolutely gorgeous um, harmonization of the of the melody to bring us to to the coda, to the to the end, which takes us back. Okay, so we've reached the last movement, and somebody's already described it as as exuberant, and it's this sort of folk style mem melody is robustious. Tell me, in terms of the the story, the whole of the whole piece. Describe this first melody for me, somebody. Um, is there anyone from the Hill Quartet? No. I just, I just wanted we, 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 we haven't seen them. Um, maybe someone asked Juliet from your quartet. Um, yes, actually, I can see, I can see, I can see you. Yeah. Are the, are, um, who, anyone who hasn't spoken yet, who would like to? No. Okay, not to worry. Maybe Amarins, tell me. Describe this last movement melody in the context of the story of the whole piece? Well, for me, I mean, I, I think I already said, but it's the most kind of all the built up tension kind of explodes <laughs> um, into this like jubilant, um, but it's not just jubilant, is it? Because it has this like tension underneath the yum, brum, 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 the, the very rhythmical, um, you know, accompaniment. Um, oh, no, not, um, What's the most surprising thing about the first bar? It's C major. Yes. I mean, this is completely extraordinary. We're in an E minor piece. We've got to the last movement. Yes. And we're in C major. And why is it C major in particular rather than D major or A major? Mm. Um, I don't know. More open, more ringing, but D major is ringing. Yeah. What, and what happens to the melody? What happens to the key in bar eight, for instance? Brief momentarily. It goes back to E minor. Yes. Right. And then what? Two bars later. And back to E major, or back to C major, sorry. Yeah, correct. Right. So it's like a little bit of a inward going moment, and then it goes back. Oh, no. Yeah, exactly. So so we're supposed to be in E minor. We're expecting E minor. We get C major, which in itself feels very jubilant, apart from the character and melody in itself. But C, C is this yeah. note that we've been talking about right from when we are. Uh, <laughs> Right from there, the, the falling in relation of, of the note C to E in E minor. Um, so having all the time played on that tension, we just start in C major. So C becomes the main note. But yeah. then the note, then the music slips into E minor at bar eight. And then it's kind of an unceremoniously yanked back into C major two bars later. So there's, there's this. Um, tension between the two 
he repeats that. Um, it slips into E minor again in bar 17. And then it's really determinedly dragged back into C major by these, these four chords. Um, <laughs> Really being forced back into C major and it stays into C minor and this this and that repeats again. So it goes on and on and on this back and forth between E minor and C major um, until uh, for ages until it um, it gets to E minor in bar 52, which is a long way down uh, down the piece, and that's a brief um, modulating passage which takes us to B minor, the dominant of E minor. Um, so really the, the whole of this long melody of the last movement is, is, is already prepared for by the first movement. And then the second movement has been a reminder of it and the third movement has been a reminder of it. This CBE is the kind of the key, the key thing. Um, and I don't know about the character. Um, Sini had said that it ends in complete calamity and tragedy. Um, you're describing the beginning of this, and I agree with you. It's rumbustious and very positive, and and actually the melody. The, uh, I mean that rhythm is a sort of riding rhythm slightly, isn't it? I mean I think it's quite it's galloping. It's quite fun, um, and and there's a sort of good energy to it. Um, so I think he's really trying, I mean, I think he's not trying, but he's succeeding at being, you know, in a really positive mood, in a, in a, in a really um, upbeat, optimistic, exuberant folk style melody in, in this. And then he keeps being pulled away from it and he keeps forcing his way back. And that's sort of the nature of the melody. Has anyone else got a view of the character of this? Eliza, what do you think? I think um, it's really interesting to see, in fact, very much in the third movement as well, it's just always this interplay between um, like the more folkloric and the learned style that he's yeah. and clearly like it's a commission for big money. Um, and he, and there's some uh, sort of like some parody of of how the the, Rus the tema russe is conveyed because it's kind of tongue in cheek, it feels. Yeah, Maybe actually, with, you know, with hindsight now listening to the fourth movement, well, playing the fourth movement, the third movement too is also maybe more parody than we had than sort of sentiment. I don't yes, know. I'm not sure if it's parody because that's slightly distancing. I just feel there is this tension between mm. the upbeat, fun, and playfulness of the trio and uh, of the middle section, the majority and the character, the opening. And maybe it's the same here. There's a tension between this character or a big contrast between this character and the character of the first movement, yeah. and the character of how it's going to end. I suppose. Mm. But that's that's been the the, the tension throughout the piece, really. Mm. Um, the other thing, just to point out, is that this rhythm, but a dumb. I mean, it's it's amazing how much rhythm has been motivic in this piece, rather than in many in most in most Beethoven pieces. But da da yabba bum, which we hear in the first part, is all over the movement. It's written all over the movement in different melodies. Um, so um, we're slightly drawn to then there's, there's the, the B minor melody, which I talked about in bar 70. Um, sorry, that melody. That also has Neapolitan features, doesn't it? Because it, it, it touches on F major and then comes away from it. So that, that tension continues through it. Um, and then we have the really fun passage where we hand over da -da -dum, da -da, that rhythm is, is we hear it in spades being handed over between the instruments. Um, it's always better if you fall off and get it wrong because the audience much prefer it that way. <laughs> so don't practice it too much. <laughs> um, uh, I'm slightly rushing through this. Uh, letter G bar 146 which is the big fortissimo section with Schwartz Sand, offbeat Schwartz Sandy. So um, that section. Uh, this is also a place where there's a 
handover. Four, four bars in the first violin, four bars in the cello, four bars in the first violin, uh, four bars in the cello. And again, watch out for these handovers. They shouldn't be the same. They shouldn't be repetitive. So some of them modulate and some of them don't. And that's really important. So the first violin at the end of its fourth bar, handing over to the cello, is handing over in the same key. So it doesn't need to be a big deal. The cello, however, handing over back to the first violin, is modulating to A minor. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> and so the cello needs to make that, that, that modulation, needs to, needs to play it in a way which leads to A minor feeling the only result of the way the cello's played it. Um, um, uh, what else can I tell you, or ask you rather? Um, I think I'm slightly, I think most of it is self-explanatory. I mean, I'm sure you will recognize bar 342, which is really towards the end, uh, where the cello has this rude question and followed by a big rest. Uh, again, we you know we have the Neapolitan F major, F, uh, which is related to the C as well. The C and the F relate. So, so, and then back to E minor, immediately back to E minor. But that happens twice. Um, and so, the end, the last hurrah for the C major melody is at bar three seventy two, where the, the is in fortissimo and sempre fortissimo and octaves and it's very big um and then we get to the e minor in bar 378 in about after about seven bars and lo and behold this is the first time that e minor is not yanked back into c major but it continues in e minor um and then we're into the coda, which is really all in E minor. And it's interesting that uh, letter S, which is 395, about 15 bars from the end, where there's yet another sempre fortissimo. Um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the cello has... The cello touches on the Neapolitan with that F, but it's completely brushed aside. It means nothing anymore. It's just part of a sequence. So we need to hear it, but it's, it's, no, it's just part of a scale. It no longer has the significance that it has. So we end in this um, tremendous E minor flurry of, 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 of um, repeatedly hammered out E minor chords. So there's no doubt that E minor is the key of the piece and the final mood and so on. Okay, sorry, I've slightly talked you through that rather than asked you questions through that because because we, we um, my clock makes me about three minutes away from 9.30. Has anyone got a question they are burning to ask? No, <laughs> no burning. <laughs> Smouldering will do. No, okay. Um, well, I just want to stress again that I know incredibly little about harmony. I, I, I never studied music at college or anything. I've just sort of picked up bits and pieces. And mostly what I've been talking about is tonic and dominant and, and resolving into certain keys and, and the flat and six and the Neapolitan, that's it. That's the whole thing. That's all I've mentioned in terms of harmony. There are many chords I don't know the names of, um, but, if one feels those relationships, then it, 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 it's, it, it's key to it's knowing a lot about what's going on in the piece. In other words, there's a harmonic design, which is part of the story the piece is telling, telling as well as the motives and the melodies. And, um, and in this piece, it goes through the whole structure of the whole piece. And um, I think it does very much affect the way we play it if we feel it, I say feel it rather than know it, 
um, because because that, that that's what it means. So just going back to the second, the third bar. It's all there, and that's why, after looking at the whole piece, I'm sort of particularly convinced that that first C has to be expressive and noticed. I mean, not by holding up a placard saying, ladies and gentlemen, this is important. We're not giving a lecture. But I think if it's sufficiently flattened and clear and the note before it is played in a way that knows the C is coming, then people will just feel it, even if they don't consciously notice it, they'll feel it. And, and, and then when the F major fragment comes immediately afterwards and the C is then heard as a, as a harmless little dominant, um, they'll feel the difference. And, and I think that even if the audience know nothing about harmony, if they feel that, then they're, then they're inside the piece as much as we are. And, um, and that's why I think it's very important. <laughs>